Hello everybody, welcome back to Red Tool House. In today's video, I wanna address a question I run into from time to time, and that's from those of you that want to start saw milling, so you want to buy a mill, but you're not quite sure what's the additional equipment you need and how much is it going to cost. So that's what I wanna address in this video. What's the minimum equipment you need to complement your saw mill so you can have a safe and efficient milling process? So follow along with me. So if you're considering buying a mill, of course, the first thing you look at is the overall price of the mill itself. And, you know, these things range from all over the place. So used on the market, maybe two, three thousand dollars. You get into new four, five, six, seven, fifty, seventy thousand dollars. These band mills can get very expensive very quickly. But if you're just taking that cost into consideration, then I, I don't think you're really putting your budget together well because there's other things you need to be able to operate this in a safe and efficient manner. So I wanna list the tools that I think, and I, I wanna stress, I think, that you need, the minimum tools you need, to operate your mill. And I also wanna break out costs so you can get an idea exactly what those peripherals are going to cost. So to do this video fairly, I think we have to make certain assumptions because we could obviously get too broad or get too deep in the weeds. But the first assumption is that we're going to assume that you're getting your logs off your property or you're having logs delivered here to your property. So whether they're coming off the land or someone's bringing them to you versus say you've got to go out and find logs and bring them in yourselves. You're not going to address the equipment needed with that. Although if you Google log arch trailers, there's some pretty cool uh, designs some of these guys have where they're actually going and getting that. These guys that do these big slabs, they're going and uh, actually going into these neighborhoods with these utility trailers that, are, that have this log arch pivot thing that they can uh, pick up those logs without having a huge piece of equipment in somebody's backyard. Anyway, let's get off of that. Assumption number two is that we're specifically talking about bandsaw mills. We're not talking about chainsaw mills. We're not talking about huge frick mills, those type of things. We're just talking about bandsaw mills. And the third assumption we're making is that we're talking about what I think are the bare minimum tools. Now there's obviously tools that you can keep adding and, and no matter what you're working on, any project you have in any genre of, of skill or trade, there's always tools that you can get to make your job easier, safer, faster, more cost effective, whatever. We're gonna talk about the bare minimum because I'm kind of looking at this from a homesteader's perspective or a small farmer who wants to have the mill to help do what he's trying to do on his farm. So what is the main issue that needs to be addressed when operating a sawmill that comes to the production of the work you're trying to do there? Well, I think the biggest issue is the weight of the material, the raw material you're using. You're using logs and those turkeys can get pretty heavy pretty quick. If one of these guys would move when you don't want them to move or go where you don't want them to go, then you can tear up a lot of equipment quickly or you can even injure yourself or kill yourself pretty badly. Are there varying degrees of killing yourself? <laughs> anyway, it's bad stuff when they move when you don't want them to. So you gotta figure out a way to move them safely. So just how heavy are we talking about here? Well, I think it's interesting. I'm gonna put a link down in the video description to the Department of Interior that offers this log weight chart. I thought it was interesting. It's like, okay, somebody decided to put all that together. But we're dealing with green logs and varying species that are marketable timber species. The standard species you'd expect to talk about when you're talking about milling. So what is the heaviest green log in North America? Well, not surprising, it's the live oak. And you see that obviously in the South. We don't grow those around here, but I have experience, actually I have some pretty good experience with live oak when we did Hurricane Katrina cleanup in Macomb, Mississippi. I cut more live oak than I hope to ever see in my life, but um, those turkeys are big and they are heavy. Because I think they're basically a five gallon bucket of water with some bark around the outside of them. So according to this chart, a cubic foot, so a one by one by one square of live oak weighs 76 pounds. That's pretty substantial. On the opposite side of the chart, you have red spruce that a one cubic feet of that weighs right at 34 pounds. So use an example, I'm sitting on a red oak log and this red oak log is about 18 inches in diameter, which is going to bring that up to about 800 to 900 pounds. But just to show what you're dealing with on the smaller scale, so a 12 inch red oak log that's 10 feet long is going to be 490 pounds green. So even a small 12 inch diameter log is got a lot of weight behind it. That's not something you're gonna move by yourself very easily. 
Okay, so enough of the science class. Let's talk about tools. The first category involves getting the logs from here, the woods, or the bush, as my Canadian friends like to say, and getting them down to here, where the sawmill is. Obviously, there has to be some transportation. So what does it take to do that? Well, obviously, the first thing you need is the tools to turn that tree, or that tree, or that tree, or that tree, whichever, to turn that tree into a log. You need felling equipment, so a chainsaw and the proper safety equipment that goes along with that. I know that you guys have watched the channel, you sometimes think, Troy, do you even know what safety equipment is? Yes, I have it in my side-by-side, -side, and I use it from time to time. Thank you very much. So chainsaw could be your, one of your biggest expenses that we're talking about here. And of course with chainsaws you can start anywhere. You can look on the used market. I've seen chainsaws at flea markets for a hundred bucks. Don't know that I'd trust my life with it, but uh, that's a place you can start. Electric chainsaws, and eh, depending on the size of work you're doing, I don't know that that's going to be the most ideal situation for you. To me, when it comes to chainsaws, if it's in your budget, get the biggest and best you can. Now obviously you don't want to buy a V-twin that it takes two people to move, but I recommend going with a good sized chainsaw that can do felling, that can do firewood, that can do all those things that you want to do. Now you can mess around and, and try all these different brands and get mixed results, but if you really want to do what's right and start with the best, then of course start with the still. So for the sake of budgeting, I'm estimating $700 for a really nice chainsaw. All right, so what about the safety equipment? Safety equipment you should be using, most likely, when felling trees, of course, is some sort of hard hat eye protection, ear protection, hand protection in the form of gloves, and most important, chaps. Now, if you're like me and you put all these things on and you can't even begin to move because your glasses fog up, it's either too hot or too cold in the woods, blah, 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 you have all these excuses, it's all fine until you stick the chainsaw in your face. So just be warned. So what do you need once you get that tree on the ground and cut into your first log? Well, of course, you've got to transport it from where it lays to the sawmill. And that's going to require some basic tools like chains, uh, toe straps, winches and cables, whatever you think fits the best. And of course, a piece of equipment to actually move that out of the woods and down to the mill. So here's what I like to have. I like to have obviously some chains, some cables, snatch blocks, pulleys, those type of things. Not as critical to have all that extra, but a chain, toe strap maybe, and some cables will be very helpful. Also a can hook or a PV so that you can move the log around a little bit to get your chain underneath it well and get your strap tied off, whatever you're going to be using there. And then of course, the actual piece of equipment to move it out. Now we use the tractor primarily to drag things out. So if we factor that in, obviously that's a very big expense. If you have a tractor already, you're in good shape. I think the, um, you know, you've got other options like four wheelers, side by sides, pickup truck. Uh, I think there's one guy on YouTube, I think it's the is it the Bearded Craftsman or whatever? Um, shoot, can't remember the name, but those guys have like a Geo Metro with a back cut off of it, and that's what they skid logs out and, and move their lumber around with. So whatever does it for you. Team of horses, if that works. So let's list those things that you need there. So let's say you know, a couple logging chains or straps, you know, maybe 50, 50 bucks around that range. A good can hook or PV is going to be around $100 new. You can obviously buy that used. Check those out at old antique stores and stuff. Maybe get a better deal on that. And of course your piece of equipment. So I'm going to say for the sake of this discussion, let's say you get a used, decent sized four-wheeler. So a little 4x4 four four ATV that you found used for $2,000. Great deal. Now, as I mentioned, there's obviously an opportunity to upgrade all of these things, but and we're not going to get into that. But the one thing I think is important to look at, and, and this is what you guys comment a lot and what I discuss on our channel, is that when I skid logs out, uh, dragging them on the ground, of course, that gets them very dirty. So then when they get to the mill, they have to be cleaned or I have to worry about going through blades a lot faster. So uh, you could upgrade and then get log arches with the, the dolly wheels in the back. You could obviously get a nice skitter, all those type of things, a skidding cone, so at least the nose isn't getting pushed in, uh, the dirt. So there's all kinds of things you can look at, but those are upgrades we're not going to address. Now you may be saying, well, I can dodge some cost, Troy, instead of bringing the logs to the mill, what if I brought the mill to the logs and then I don't have to have a piece of equipment to skid? Well, that could be an option, but keep in mind that with your mill, you then have to have a portable element to your mill. So like for my mill, putting the trailer package on it was another thousand dollars or more, I believe. And then I still have to have a piece of equipment to move it from point A to point B. It's not like I'm just gonna pull it behind by hand. 
And depending on what your land's like, you may not be able to hook that up to your daily driver and just move it from point A to point B. So in my situation, I'd still need either a tractor or a four-wheeler to move it to the logs. And you're still going to need the chainsaw. You're still going to need some of those things uh, to get the logs ready anyway. So the next category of tools deals with the scenario where you've got the logs here at the mill, and now you've got to get the logs on the mill. So that takes some equipment as well. So this task really depends on the, the height of your mill. So in this situation where I have the trailer package on my mill, of course it makes it much higher. So lifting a heavy log from the ground up to that height requires a little bit more effort than it would if I didn't have the trailer package on and say the mill was only six to eight inches off the ground. That's something to consider when you're buying a mill, just how high is that bed going to be? The lower the bed, the more I would be bending over to operate it. The higher it is, the more comfortable it is, but the higher I have to lift the log. So there are various ways and methods you can use to come up with lifting logs up onto your bed. Again, depending on the height, it could be something simple as just two ramps that you've made out of pieces of wood and your can hook that you're going to try to work up there. Just keep in mind, if it's something that simple, there's a chance that that log is going to roll back instead of rolling forward, and then you have to dance with that as it comes towards you. Another simple step up would maybe be ramps and a winch. So instead of just working your can hook, maybe you've got somebody on the winch as well. So as you can hook it, the winch kind of keeps it in place, some way to stabilize it there, or you let the winch do all the work as you're pulling it up. If you have a tractor that doesn't necessarily have a front loader, then one of the three-point hitch attachments could be a pig pole or a shortened pig pole that would allow you to lift your logs up your one side at a time maybe and get those put into place there. Of course, a tractor with a bucket makes things easier. That's what we do, but we still have a little bit of issues lifting the heavier logs up because it exceeds the weight of my bucket sometimes. Obviously, a big excavator with a thumb could easily pick that up and set it in place depending on the size of that where I've seen some guys actually build a shelter over their sawmill and they use a chain hoist with a heavy beam to be able to lift the log up, slide it over on the rail system and lower it back down. So for the sake of safety and ease and cost effectiveness, I would recommend the bare minimum for getting logs up onto the bed would be a ramp system with a winch for safety. And if it's low and you can't hook up, that's fine, but I think you need that tie off for safety to keep it from rolling back. Again, a 490 pound log rolling back and hitting you just above the ankle, you're done for about six to eight weeks. Now you can obviously engineer something. If you have that experience, if you have that ability, you've got a friend that's got a welder, whatever the case may be, you can come up with your own ramps and come up with your own winch system. Uh, if you don't wanna do that, most of these sawmills that you're buying have loading systems. I know the Norwood system involves metal ramps with some tabs that help keep the log from rolling back. Has an anchored winch on the side of the frame and you run the cable out around the log and bring it actually back and hook it onto the chassis of the, the bed. That way when you're cranking, as that cable tightens, it's turning the log and rolling it up into place. Now that system purchased and shipped out the door is about a grand. So that's a pretty big expense. But I'm gonna put that into our cost list just so we can see how this all breaks out. So now that you've found ways to get the log on the mill, is that all you need with equipment and supplies? Well, not really. Actually, you need saw blades, of course, because one saw blade isn't gonna cut it. Eh, well, I'll cut it for a little bit. But that's gonna get dull and you're gonna to need to replace it or you're going to need to sharpen it. I recommend more than one blade because sometimes blades can get damaged when some dummy drives them into the log rests or they just break because of wear and tear. The way I buy my blades in a set of five, a set of 10, usually around 25 bucks a piece plus shipping. Now, when those blades get dull, you don't wanna just throw them away, of course, and, and buy a new one. You've got to find a way to get those sharpened. If you've got a local sharpening service, that would be great. Maybe that's a way that you get started without having to have the expense or the skills of sharpening your own. If you use the mail order sharpening services, just watch. It really adds to the expense because of the shipping to and back. And then sometimes, in my experience, you don't get all your blades back because they're like, oh, that one's too damaged to sharpen, so we threw it away. So that adds to a lot of cost. What I recommend, if you don't have a local sharpener, is look at learning that skill as quickly as possible. Uh, you can obviously buy the big jigs. Norwood has, they, they sent me one that's a sharpening jig. It works great. Uh, it's about $800. Uh, 
Uh, and it's, it's paying for itself over time because I can just keep sharpening and sharpening and sharpening. But I think you could also do a pretty good job sharpening just a little bit more handwork, just using tools and just taking the time uh, to learn that skill and kind of get consistent in how you sharpen each tooth. Other basic supplies you need, of course, are gasoline. Now, for my mill with this uh, 14 horse engine I believe it has on it, it hardly uses any gas, so it's, it's really nominal. I have a five gallon can of gas that, that lasts me for months. So not a huge expense there. Uh, another thing to consider though is water. And here in West Virginia, we take water for granted because it falls out of the sky constantly. So I can obviously go to the creek and fill up the water for the, the coolant system. But some of you guys don't necessarily have easy access to water and it doesn't come uh, readily available as it does here. So just factor that in. If you're out rural somewhere in the bush, and you're milling, then just make sure you're bringing your own water in or you found a source for water there. So if you've made it to this point, you should be stacking high stacks of lumber, air drying out for future projects, building projects or woodworking projects, whatever you've decided to get the mill for, you should be well on your way to go there. Now, when we talk about wood storage and, and wood drying, wow, we could go 25,000 different directions. So I think just starting out, you can kind of do just what I'm doing here. Just stack them up outside. Maybe put a piece of tin on top to keep the rain off of it. So what's the damage on that total list of additional equipment you need above and beyond your mill? Well, if we add all this stuff up and you can kind of see the range we're dealing with here, it's not something to sneeze at. It's a, it's a substantial additional cost that you have to have factored in. If your budget only covers the cost of the mill and you don't have this other equipment, then you're going to be kind of dead in the water until you can figure out how to overcome these specific issues. So make sure you've counted all the costs and you've weighed what you need to actually get to the point where you're milling and putting up wood the way you want to. So let me know what you think. Let me know if I've left something out. Comment below if I've forgotten a piece of equipment, something you feel is very important that you would put on the list of the bare minimum you need to run the milling operation, or maybe something you disagree with. Let's comment below and get a dialogue going. All right, well, I appreciate everybody watching. Take care.